Thank you. It's nice to be in front of the home crowd. Uh, so this is Sputnik, uh, the first satellite ever launched into space by humans. That sounds kind of funny, like maybe monkeys did it first, but... Um, I've been dwelling on this image for a little while. Um, it's a very pretty thing, uh, Sputnik. And uh, it's kind of a metaphor for what I want to talk about today, sort of a dichotomy between uh, science and tech engineering and technical things and math and beauty and uh, poetry and, and things like that on the other hand. Uh, you know, Sputnik was, was built certainly by a team of scientists and, and engineers and mathematicians, uh, you know, nerds, right? And I can say that because I'm, I'm a nerd. Um, but look how beautiful it turned out. Uh, it's almost like the engineers who worked on Sputnik thought that if we're going to be responsible for sending up the first piece of space junk, then we want it to look nice, right? We want it to somehow pay homage to the beautiful natural objects that are already out in the, in the solar system. So Sputnik was launched in 1957, about five years before I was born. It orbited Earth for about three months before it skidded back into the atmosphere and burned up from the friction. And for 22 days of its flight, while its batteries lasted, uh, it sent back radio signals to Earth, and ham radio operators in the United States could pick up those signals as it passed overhead. And it did pass directly over the United States many times. So to me, uh, by any conceivable measure, Sputnik is this singular signpost uh, that marks the beginning of the technological age. When I was in school your age, uh, that was the space age, right? Um, and to date, that era has given us, uh, like Uday pointed out, the, the phones that are in your pockets and bags, each of which is far, far more powerful than anyone who ever worked on Sputnik or the Apollo program or Mercury or Gemini or even the early space shuttle program could have ever conceived. So Sputnik has a pretty good legacy. Um, the trouble was, in 1957, if you were an American, Sputnik was a time of great fear and loathing. The thing is, Sputnik wasn't launched by us. It was launched by our ideological enemy in the Cold War, the Russians. <laughs> Another advantage of being on the home team. That's, the, that's uh, Mike and Carlin, the shortest trombone uh, concert ever. Um, <laughs> So it was a time of great fear and loathing because, you know, if, if the Russians could, if the Soviets could launch a satellite into orbit, then surely they could launch the most destructive weapons ever conceived uh, right at our cities. So this was a time of great fear. But the United States responded right away. Uh, in, within the next year, we launched our own satellite, the Explorer. We did a lot of great things like uh, create ARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency. And ARPA uh, would later go on to create a computer network, a network of computers that could talk to each other that would eventually morph into the internet, which your cell phones are plugged into. And we also, recognizing that science, technology, engineering, and mathematics were going to be key in this technological era, began to reform the way that we think about and we teach science, technology, engineering, and math in schools. And that's where I think we fell apart a little bit. I don't think those have gone too well. And that's really what I want to talk about, sort of a darker side of Sputnik's legacy. In the years after Sputnik, we've had a series of panics. It was the Cold War to begin with, but in the 70s and 80s, uh, we had a, a, a sort of a battle with Japan. We lost a lot of jobs to Japan. Japan took a lot of our uh, steel uh, making and automobile manufacturing and uh, a lot of our technological design and manufacturing jobs away uh, because they did it better, right? And we panicked over that. We had to, had to train more scientists, technologists, engineers, and mathematicians to keep up. And that's what we've been doing for a long time. And you even see it right now. It's, uh, right now it's, who is it, China and India, right? It's an, it's an economical, uh, I don't want to call it a war, but we're trying, to, we're trying to keep up. And you hear the rhetoric all the time. Um, we've got to train young people today to be the, 
to have the 21st century skills that they need to compete in this world, right? So in the ensuing years since Sputnik, we've had a lot of, a, a long series of what I think are fear-based reforms of education and math. I think we meant well, but I think we kind of screwed up. I mean, I hope we can make some changes. I've lived some of these uh, reforms uh, all my life. Even as a kid, I, I probably shouldn't say this to my students here, but I wasn't actually a very good chemistry student. I got left behind sometimes. Um, uh, it wasn't my teacher's fault. He, even back then, he had to cover so much material in the course of one year, he was required to, that sometimes I just got left in the dust. And it's even worse today. As a public school teacher, I had to work under, uh, I had to you know, become familiar with and use heaps of standards, binders full of uh, educational standards uh, in this sort of uh, uh, Byzantine prescriptive um, world that is modern education. Uh, and it, those, that, those stacks of standards make it even tougher for a teacher to get through a curriculum in the year and not leave children behind, which is kind of ironic in the era of no child left behind. Um, and I even experienced this kind of thing uh, working on uh, my local school board. Every month or so, I see some new edict or some new initiative trickle down onto the heads of teachers and students. And it seems to me that we're getting to a point where we don't actually want to have teachers in schools anymore. What we really want is instructors of the curriculum. And those th two things are entirely different. Okay. Uh, I remember when I was a graduate student studying chemistry, uh, people would ask me uh, what I did for a living and I would start talking about chemistry. And usually when the word chemistry popped up, I'd get the thousand yard stare. And uh, almost always people would say, oh, I hated chemistry. And you know, as a bona fide nerd, um, I, looking back, that was heartbreaking for me. Um, Richard Feynman, a Nobel Prize winning physicist, once said that, if human beings had to give up all of our knowledge of science and how the, na how, how the universe works, uh, and, but we can only choose to keep one thing from which to rebuild, that he would choose to keep, uh, I'm losing my technology, um, he would choose to keep uh, the atomic hypothesis. Okay? The, that's the idea that all matter, all, all stuff, is made up of fundamental building blocks called atoms and that there really aren't that many different kinds of atoms, and that even, even different kinds of atoms are more the same than they are different. And that's not only the fundamental foundation of chemistry. For someone who loves chemistry, that's the fundamental poetry of chemistry. What else besides poetry could write everything there is in the universe with so few words? I don't want people to hate chemistry, by the way, uh, or science or physics or anything like that. I missed a few things. Uh, by the way, if you, uh, if you hate chemistry today, you can go onto the I Hate Chemistry Facebook page. And I'm sure there's one for physics and, and math, too. So knock yourself out. Um, some bad language there, too, I had to block out. People feel, feel, feel very strongly about it, right? So um, there's not enough time to, think about, to talk about all the things that we can do. But I think there's one thing that we really have to do as a nation before anything else is going to work, um, to try and bring back some of the joy uh, into, into, in learning, of learning science and math. Uh, and, and really, it's become too much of a joyless uh, enterprise that just needs to be survived for too many kids, I think. The thing we have to do as a nation of voters, citizens, educators, politicians, and so forth, and I'm not being facetious about this, we need to chill out. Right? We need to do some yoga. Take a breath. It's not that bad. The sky is not falling. We've gotten really good over the last uh, 50 years since, since uh, Sputnik at stinking thinking. Whenever we see things like this, this is the 2007 TIMS uh, math test. It's, a, it's one of many uh, international tests that this particular one tested eighth graders. And you can see that the United States in ninth, is in ninth place. Uh, behind the countries that are listed there. And uh, you know, every time this, something like this comes out, what happens is it gets into the newspapers, it's on televisions, uh, television, pundits talk about it, politicians talk about it, 
um, somebody convenes a task force, and the task force writes a really depressing report with a title like uh, A Nation at Risk. And uh, it's, it's, it's just too much. It's all got to stop. And it's really, uh, it's speaking as a teacher, it's really not helpful. Okay. Uh, what happens is we end up having more and more standards. Uh, you know, we, we, ha we, teach, we do standards-based education in our country right now. Um, so, so we sort of prescribe everything that needs to be taught and teachers are responsible for covering all those things. The thing about standards is they have a, they have a crazy entropy all their own. They always grow and grow and grow and they never diminish, right? They never shrink. Um, so, the word Sputnik in Russian means uh, fellow traveler. In the course of preparing this talk, I've, I've sort of had to wonder, uh, you know, uh, what I'm doing here. And I, and I think what I'm doing is, uh, it's, my own, it's my own call to arms. I need to, we need to do something to, to re-infuse math and science education with the joy and the beauty that I think is inside inherently. And so really I'm here to rededicate myself to trying to make that happen in any way I can. And I'm really here to ask you to help me do that. I'm going to try every day in my own classroom, my school, my community, my state. And I would even take a meeting with the president if he asked me. It's going to be a long road. It's difficult to change things that are based on fear. Fear is a powerful motivator. There's a lot of work to do. I could use some fellow travelers. Thanks.